it is a pleasure to introduce to you our third keynote speaker for today. Rathaun Chasselson is Professor of Clinical Psychology at the Fielding Graduate University and a psychotherapist in practice. She was formerly a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Harvard University and a visiting fellow at Cambridge University. She received the Henry Murray Award and the Theodore Sorbin Award from the American Psychological Association and the Distinguished Contribution to Qualitative Research Award from Division 5. Rothellen Jasselson does research on life stories from a narrative point of view. Based on interviews she has conducted over more than 30 years, she has written three books exploring women's identity, most recently, Paths to Fulfillment, Women's Search for Meaning and Identity. She is editor of the APA journal Qualitative Psychology and authored the book Interviewing for Qualitative Inquiry, a Relational Approach. What I learned from Rathelen's work is listening more closely to others, focusing on the relational aspects in interviewing, understanding the co-construction and helping my students to being more open for and interested in others' life stories. I'm very much looking forward to her talk, Plotless Stories and Unthought Knowns, Aspects of Psychological Life with COVID-19. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be taking part in this ongoing discussion. When I was asked to speak at this conference, I was excited about the possibility of talking to other scholars about the current situation created by the pandemic. But then when I considered what to talk about, I realized that I have no data and therefore cannot know anything in the usual ways in which I know things, which involves interviewing people in depth about their experience. This is research that is yet to be done. But then I realized that the whole question of knowledge is what is put at issue in these surreal times. What can we know and how do we know it? Here's how the pandemic felt at its outset. And here's what it looked like in the middle of March, in Paris, in London and in New York. As one New Yorker said, it's a weird feeling to miss the place where you are. And then by May 24th, here was the New York Times. How do we make psychological sense of these images? What do they mean to us on an individual level? My interest in narrating and conceptualizing the subjective experience of this pandemic is what um, drives me to think about this. I began then to think through various psychological theories to see if they provided frameworks or concepts with which to make sense of what is occurring in these surreal days and also to think about what would constitute data under these circumstances. Data would imply some kind of narrative about what people have been experiencing and what meanings they make of their experiences. One way in which we think about narratives is that they are means of describing and linking events. Jerome Bruner, one of the great scholars of narratives, tells us that there is no narrative until there is a violation of the canonical. What does he mean by this? A canonical narrative is one that is taken for granted and invisible within a culture. Culture provides us with a baseline of stories against which other narratives are juxtaposed. They operate in the background, so to speak, the ordinary, expectable events that fill our lives and ones that we are unlikely to relate to others. Bruno refers to these as canonical. People engage in active narrative construction only when these implicit narratives are violated. We make meaning only out of those events that stand outside of canonical narratives because the canonical narratives are already understood and need no meaning making. Stories, on the other hand, make deviations from the canonical understandable. They take the form of describing a setting 
as well as an agent who performs some action toward a goal. A story has a plot linking events. When we don't see this link, when someone tells us a story, we may ask them, so what's your point? Canonical narratives vary by culture. What is unremarkable in one culture may seem quite outside the norm in another. These are times where nearly everything is in violation of canonical narratives in every culture. In every culture, people are experiencing the reality that life as we, as we have known it has simply come to a stop. We have all never lived through such times before. Making meaning of these experiences, however, is challenging. So how to understand what is happening to us? I turn now to autoethnography as a fallback source of data. How would I narrate my own experience of this pandemic? I would start on March 12th when I went to a large grocery store near my home in New Jersey. I went to gather some potatoes and found the large potato bin empty. This seemed strange. Then, when I went to procure some butter, I found there was no butter. Then I began to feel that something very strange was going on. No potatoes, no butter. I asked one of the clerks who looked at me somewhat stupefied and said yes. And there is no chicken, no toilet paper. In fact, the store was cleaned out of a lot of things. I was aware of the coronavirus at that point but it seemed to me like it was in China and in Italy. The New York Times that day was focused on the falling stock market and the main article revealed that Trump had closed the US border to European visitors and declared, the virus will not have a chance against us, it will go away. Somehow, I had managed to forget that there were airplanes that carry things from one place to another. Still, Places that had large groups of people like schools and sporting events, as well as Broadway, were closing. On that day, the Times reported the virus was in 100 countries, had infected 120,000 people, and killed more than 4,300 around the world. Buried in that article, the Times also said, quote, ordinary life in many places will no longer be the same for the foreseeable future, as society adjusts to a new reality that transforms everything, including the global economy and everyday social interactions, not just in far off places on newscasts, but in the community right at home. On my way home, I found potatoes and butter at another store and still could not begin to imagine what we were headed for. Indeed, my story of the potatoes and butter was not just a trivial non-canonical narrative, as a violation of my taken for granted assumptions, it was a piece of a shattering of canonical narratives everywhere. Like many people I know, I tried to write a diary during this time, trying to keep track of experiences. But like my friends, I found it impossible to find things to write about in the diary. There's a meme that was going around the internet. Oh, no, I lost the slide. Well, there's a meme that's going around the internet that says, until further notice, the days of the week are now called this day, that day, other day, someday, yesterday, today, and next day. What has been limited in our narrative capacity is both futurity and with it, intentionality. This is what creates the plotlessness. My work life is unchanged from pre-virus times, because I have for years been doing my work with my students, patients, and supervisees on the internet. I am not alone, as my husband is with me, and we have developed a kind of new routine. We work all day, take a walk, have dinner, then watch some engaging TV series to enjoy the sense of escape into some other reality. Then reading time, and I spend an inordinate amount of time reading news about the virus, then bed, and the next day, start again. What is most lost is planning. Trips, excursions to theater or museums, visits with friends and family. As far as we can see, all our days will be the same, punctuated by grocery deliveries and Zoom social life. And even with those we love most, 
there is less and less to talk about. We are all in the just another day experience. Time itself has changed. Did we see the dolphins in the sea yesterday or was it last week? When did we last talk to your sister? Was the big storm two weeks ago or two months ago? Time is passing without markers. I understand that universities, archives, and historical societies are rushing to collect and curate the personal accounts of how ordinary people are experiencing this sprawling public health crisis. But what I can see from the early submissions are plotless descriptions of emotions, fear, sadness, anger, and restlessness, as well as moments of joy and hope. Here's what I cooked substitutes for often nameless emotions. Futurity, the setting of goals in time, has been compromised if not obliterated. Intentionality, the field of what one might do in a lockdown state, is severely limited. When the future is amorphous, the capacity to experience the present in narrative form changes. Unlike other shared social catastrophes, such as natural events or human-caused destruction, such as bombings in which unaffected people either get on with their lives or go to help those who have been affected, this pandemic locks people into isolated spaces in fear. Regular life is suspended. It is too dangerous to go to help, at least in most cases. We are on pause for an indefinite amount of time. What then might be a collective narrative of these times? Looking at what the media is publishing, we seem to be establishing stories about loss, trauma, and challenge. Millions of people have endured heartbreaking losses from this virus, losses of loved ones, often under horrific circumstances where they were barred from saying goodbye to parents or spouses dying in care homes. Otherwise, healthy loved ones have suddenly sickened and died, often denied medical attention that might have saved them. Each of the mourners has a painful narrative. Yet such narratives or loss are part of the canon of stories that accompany disasters that we are all familiar with after such tragedies as 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, or the Japanese tsunami. There are also growing numbers of lost narratives centering on unemployment or business failures. Workers suddenly find themselves without income, dependent on unpredictable government benefits which they may or may not be eligible for and may or may not be able to procure. People with successful businesses or occupations have found themselves suddenly facing financial ruin. And these two are tragic stories but stories we have encountered before in times of economic downturns or natural disasters, though none of them have been as widespread or deep as this one. As I said before, I cannot speak directly from data and in my isolated state only have access to experiences of people like me who are among the privileged. We are privileged in that we have comfortable places to live and sufficient means to have food and necessities of life and yet there are profound psychological losses. What is different about this pandemic are the often untold stories of losses, untold because they seem trivial in the face of others' tragic losses, but they involve loss of aspects of life and identity that are nevertheless highly disruptive. What I've put on the screen are some illustrative newspaper headlines of the evolving story of ordinary life. Private disruptions involve losses of expectable aspects of life, of routines that are foundational to our sense of ourselves, and these have psychological consequences that we are just beginning to try to understand. Everyone is fine in adapting, a friend tells me somewhat sheepishly, but I can't play golf. This is a friend whose social life and sense of himself has long been organized around his golf game. For him, being kept from the golf course indefinitely is an enormous personal loss, and he is at pains to know what to do with himself without his golf game. And then there are the high school graduates who will not have a prom or a commencement ceremony, who don't know if universities they plan to attend will open in the fall, in person anyway. 
and the college graduates who might have been seeking to begin their careers who now see no clear paths to doing so. In the face of death and bankruptcies, these seem minor, but they have deep psychological consequences. Loss of a golf course or a prom is something people can eventually come to terms with, but they signify the loss of identity and a predictable world. Our psychological stability is based on feeling grounded, feeling that we can move through the world with some sense that we can take for granted certain cultural givens, like butter in the grocery store or a commencement when we graduate from high school or college. If these disappear, what can we count on? The loss of grounding is central to trauma. Traumatic events shatter one's sense of security, making us feel helpless in a dangerous world. I strongly dislike using the word trauma loosely. The word trauma in this pandemic fits the experience of some of the first responders and the healthcare workers trying to give medical assistance to an overload of people, too many to attend to. People making life and death decisions when supplies and time are inadequate, risking their own and their families' lives to help others in the absence of enough personal protective equipment. These are traumas. Traumatic experiences, though, involve a threat to life or safety, but any situation that leaves people feeling overwhelmed and isolated can result in trauma. And feelings of loss of self, brought on by losses in the cultural rituals that structure our lives, can involve psychological states akin to trauma. We cannot judge the extent of other sense of loss and fear. It's not the objective circumstances that determine whether an event is traumatic, but the subjective emotional reaction to the experience. I'm not ready to argue that loss of playing golf or going to a prom is a trauma on the level of what healthcare workers have endured. But I do think that these stories, which I call plotless stories, are going to be part of our collective narrative of these times, often untold, because they aren't stories in the usual sense and are often untold because of the shame in mourning the quotidian when others are grieving for losses of loved ones. These are stories about the tears in the fabric of life as we have known it. And because they do not follow any of the usual trajectories of familiar stories, they are suppressed even while their effects can be pervasive. The overall shape of these stories is the world my world is not as it was. These stories refract at a deeper level our vulnerability. For the first time in her life, my daughter is inaccessible to me because the border between the US and Canada where she lives is closed. I cannot see my grandchildren except on a screen. I long to feel them in my arms. I try to remember my two-year-old granddaughter with her soft little arms around my neck, snuggling into me. She is doing fine, but I have lost all those moments that might have been. And I have lost the possibility of going to help my daughter who is struggling to be a professor and take care of little ones with no daycare. There is no plot here, just a litany of loss of expectable life. Beyond my own experience and that of my family and friends, in what I read in newspapers and magazines, the uh, only other data I have comes from my psychotherapy patients. All of the people I see for therapy are high functioning people who came to therapy to deal with relatively mild states of anxiety or depression or difficulties in their relationships. My friends say to me, I guess you're hearing a lot about anxiety and depression brought on from the COVID-19 situation from your patients. But the reality is I am not. With most of my patients, people who live all over the world, we now check in about how things are in our home places and recognize that with some minor variations in lockdowns and reopenings, we are all pretty much confined to our private spaces. Then we go on to the meat of therapy, which is dealing with the selves that they have been and are trying to better understand and change. The underlying assumption, which I find myself sharing, is that we will one day go back to normal and be who we have always been in a world that is as it has always been. 
That is perhaps the central arc of the larger plot of the pandemic story, a plot we are collectively developing. There is a before and there will be an after, while the present is a time in limbo, a way station between the self in a world we have known and the self in a world that we find ourselves in when this pandemic goes away. This brings me to the concept of the unthought known. The idea was developed by psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas. The idea represents what we know through sensory or pre-conscious experience, but are not able to think about. It is a hallmark of infants' earliest experience of being infants feeling themselves in a particular kind of embrace by those who form their world. These sensory experiences form the basic structure of the personality, but they are felt rather than thought. In later life, unthought knowns are things we may have forgotten or find ourselves playing out in action. We may have an intuitive sense for these early experiences, but we cannot yet put them into words and cannot direct our thinking towards them. In the last several years, there has been an upsurge of ideas about this implicit dimension of experience, that which is in some sense known, but not yet available to thought or language. Some have termed this unformulated experience, and psychoanalysis is paying more attention to these states of being. The unthought known is something that is there and not there, more than can, can be put into words. It can be communicated in image and perhaps in metaphor. And poets have tried to represent it. Here's an image which also represents it for me and, um, and a poem, which maybe I'm too small for you to read, so I'll read it for you. This is from T.S. Eliot, The Four Quartets. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. And for me, this is Eliot's effort to put into language the unthought known. Wilfred Bion was working with similar ideas when he wrote about the distinction between beta and alpha function. Beta elements are most evident in the infant who is filled with sensory experience that they cannot think about. Beta elements are felt but not represented in thought, much like Bolas's unthought known. But the representation of these elements would be alpha function. In human development, it is the mother's thinking capacity, what Beyond called alpha function, which contains the beta elements, the sensory experience of her child, and this over time makes it possible for the child to become able to think. Alpha function transforms the undigested facts of internal and external experience into thought. We can think of this as the difference between apprehending something and comprehending it. One unthought known, the beta elements in the current crisis, is what Ernest Becker called the rumble of panic underneath everything. We have a heightened awareness of the existential contradiction between having a symbolic self that seems to give humans infinite worth in a timeless scheme of things, and our physical selves, which involve a mortal body. To Becker, culture is part of an immortality project of a symbolic self that serves the denial of death. As the coronavirus is a mortal danger to our physical selves, we see how the adjustments to flee it have threatened what we know of culture. As we withdraw from one another in fear, Economic and social arrangements are in disarray, and cultural support seem to be either disappearing 
or on hold for some unspecified amount of time. Unformulated experience is a moment-to-moment -moment state of vagueness and possibility. These beta experiences, the realm of the unthought known, is the painful and disruptive sense that the normal is gone and we cannot yet think about what might take its place. I am struck by how frequently when I talk to friends, they say, I can't think about that, or I don't wanna think about that. These phrases come up when our conversation drifts to the future. In the current situation, we have lost our ability to plan and with it, the capacity to envision the future. The future itself has become an unthought known and to think about that may be terrifying. In early life, beta experiences are transformed by a container, someone whose thinking enables our own capacity to think. In Beyond's formulation, that is the function of the mother. In order to think about the future in the current crisis, we would need a container, someone who has a capacity to think about it in much the way the mother can soothe the infant through her capacity to think. Is there anyone or anything that can offer the alpha function that we need, the reassurance that it will all turn out okay because they are thinking for us? Can anyone hold for us the promise that we can return to some semblance of life as we've known it? Unthought knowns can be collective as well as individual. We each have our own private demons and apocalyptic worries, but these can exist at the larger levels of society as well. What are we as a collective keeping at bay, keeping ourselves from thinking about? In order to think about the future, we need knowledge of the present, and this too is obscure. Right now, our knowledge of reality is mediated through screens and print media. From our lockdown state, we rely on others to tell us what is going on in the world, even as we recognize that everyone has only a very limited view. This in part accounts for the inordinate amount of time I spend reading news, trying to get a sense of knowing something about what the world is like and that others know something about it. The New York Times has become my however imperfect container. If we look back on the last several months, we note that within a couple of days, the genome of the novel coronavirus, now named COVID-19, was sequenced in China in a couple of days. This was something of a miracle of modern technology. Our science reacted quickly and we could identify the foe. Yet since then, our capacity to know has faltered or ground to a halt. We still know little about the transmissibility of this virus, which leaves us not knowing just where to identify risk. As a result, we are in effect directed to be afraid of nearly everything, all other people who we don't live with, all surfaces outside our private spaces. We look to our leaders for containment, much as we once as children looked to our parents. Surely someone must know what to do. The scientists can find a way to stop this monstrous thing before it kills us all. Our leaders are charged with the responsibility of looking out for our welfare. Surely they will find a way for us to live safely while the scientists find the solution. But as we have seen, except in a few fortunate countries where leadership has been efficient, timely, and wise, our leaders have been focused on their own political advantage and willing to lie and dissemble in order to create a self-serving narrative. Conspiracy theories with their alternative narratives are proliferating. Collectively, we engage in painful epistemic disputes with detailed and often threatening counter-realities. But we need some form of shared reality in order to be able to think. It is thinking that wards off panic and containment that makes it possible for the alpha function of thought. One of the most present dangers is losing our collective capacity to think at all. This experience has taught me, taught me much about the containment function of leadership. One leader who has embodied containment for me is Andrew Cuomo, the, May, the governor of New York, who in his daily briefing sifts through available information marks problems, offers good sense, and honestly tells us what he doesn't know. 
He enacts a thinking man, someone taking the elements of what we know and assembling them into some kind of rational whole, all the while indicating that he is as frightened and sad as we are. He doesn't offer panaceas or solutions. Rather, with his graphs and charts, he demonstrates thinking. On the day I was writing this in early May, someone asked Governor Cuomo when he thought New York would reopen, and he said he didn't know. I was struck by how containing his admission was. If someone had asked Trump the same question, he would have offered an arbitrary date based on his wishes. But Cuomo seemed at some level to understand how not knowing was highly containing. It meant that someone with the amount of authority that he possessed would be thinking about it and delaying making a decision until he had some degree of certainty that reopening made sense. He was implicitly inviting us to allow him to do some thinking for us, to assemble all those bits of terrible stories we were reading and hearing about into something like a coherent narrative that could lead to an imagined and wished for future. So we have been living now in limbo in a world beyond our understanding, a world filled with fear of the invisible in which we are locking ourselves in to keep safe. Even for people in places where there have been few cases of COVID-19, there is fear of the unseen. The invisible enemy could still appear and strike as it has in other places. Even those far away from epicenters are bombarded with images of people dying with relative suddenness and often in terrible circumstances. I doubt that there is anyone on the planet that the rumble of panic has not touched. We turn to history as a container as well. We have been here before, but it is interesting how our collective history has banished prior epidemics to the realm of the unthought known. Just a few decades after the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which killed more people than World War I, the most important American history textbooks by such distinguished historians as Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., Richard Hofstadter, Henry Steele Commager, and Samuel Elliott Morrison said not a word about the flu. It is similarly missing from Yuval Harari's sweeping account of human history in Sapiens. History evidently is a record of human intentionality. We want to assume that our human species controls its own destiny. We're in charge, we think. Like historians, we cannot accept that brainless packets of RNA and DNA can capsize the human enterprise in a few weeks or months. In the early part of the 20th century, the flu was incomprehensible. The influenza virus wasn't even identified until 1931. Now we know what it is, but so far, that hasn't done us a lot of good. So the sense of helplessness and impending disaster continue to lurk in the unthought known. Beyond the losses of life, our economic order has been dismantled, and we are told to expect worldwide economic depression. The panicky thought here is, will we have the food and other resources to sustain us? Will we be able to maintain the social order or is anarchy on the horizon? These are questions that lurk as unthinkable but vaguely foreboding. And there are others who are taking the unknown future in a different way. This is the more hopeful outlook. Can we use the devastation to build a better world? Can we see this pandemic as a preview of climate change? which would be a lot worse in terms of destruction and dislocation of the world as we know it. Could we take this more climate change more seriously now as a collective and work to prevent it? Can we restore our human intentionality to a world in which we have thus far been rendered rather helpless? And what of our economic structures? We have been rethinking what it means to be an essential worker. These are the service workers who cannot work from home because their physical presence in doing things like getting food from the fields to our tables is absolutely necessary. From those who are picking our vegetables to those who are stocking shelves in grocery stores to those who are driving the vehicles to bring them to our doors. Yet these essential workers are the lowest paid in our economic system. Is this how we want to proceed in the future? 
Do we now understand better how income inequality and limited access to health care also implies vulnerability for the rich who rely on workers to make the products that create their wealth? Is this how we want things to be going forward? The future doesn't have to be bleak. If every crisis is an opportunity, we can also work with the crystals of hope. Hopes for transformation for the better can also be part of the unthought known. So what will be the shape of the collective ending to the COVID-19 story once we create a plot for it? Will it be, and then we all went back to normal? Or, and then we tried to build a better world? Can it end with a new day dawning? And on a more personal level, we may ask ourselves, do we really want the ending to be, and then I went back to life as it was, which is unlikely to happen in any case. Or, I have a new recognition of our social interdependence and will modify my life to respect it better. We can be certain that this experience is changing us in ways we cannot yet see. In that sense, a part of the as yet unthought known part of a plot for a story not yet written. How our personal and collective stories will be implotted, as they eventually will, is still unknown. We are still in limbo, caught in a surreal present, headed for an even more uncertain future. Let us hope for the best. Thank you.